Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to Off the Deaton Path. My name is Stan Deaton with the Georgia Historical Society, and we welcome you to this podcast for the week of October 8, 2018. This week, we are featuring part two of our interview with author and historian John Furling. As I introduced John last week, he is one of the premier historians of the era of the American Revolution, the author of 14 books total on the early American period, among them some of the best books ever written on the Revolution. His latest book is entitled Apostles of Revolution, Jefferson, Payne, Monroe, and the Struggle Against the Old Order in America and Europe, published in 2018 by Bloomsbury. I sat down with John Furling to talk about his new book, the founders, and their place in contemporary American society when he was in Savannah for a GHS program. This is the second of two parts recorded at the Planters Inn in Savannah on September 13, 2018. I hope you enjoy it. Here's John Furling. Tell me if it's fair to say that Thomas Paine today is is what we might call a a professional mooch. He he seemed to, uh, he was always living with somebody else. He, uh, he, managed to ingratiate himself with people like Washington at very high levels. Um, as you mentioned earlier, he got jobs with important people. He didn't usually keep them very long. Drifted from one town, from one place to another, from one continent to another, from one country to another, uh, and, he, and he wound up dying in obscurity. Um, James Monroe I have to confess. Well, let, let yeah, me yeah. Say, let, Go ahead. So I, I wanted to take issue with okay, the, with the professional mooch. Okay. He, he was that in, in part. I, uh, it, at one time, during, when he's in France, he uh, has a friend named Nicolas Bonneville, who, who was the editor of a, a radical Parisian newspaper. And um, Bonneville invited Payne to come live, and Payne said, "Well, you know, I'll just stay for a week or so." And he stayed for five years. <laughs> yeah. So my Carol, my <laughs> wife, and I had a cat that wandered up to our house, and he just stayed. We named the cat Tom Payne. So, <laughs> so, so th- there was that side to him. But on the other hand, Payne uh, uh, during the Revolution uh, is living in Philadelphia and he's, he's earning money from common sense and his other, other publications. And from that job he has for a, a year or more as a secretary for that congressional committee. And he has his own apartment. It's not a fancy apartment or anything, but he has and Washington his, visits him. Once, uh, doesn't right. He? Yeah. In his apartment. Right. Yeah. And, uh, so did Lafayette and, uh, visited him and, and other dignitaries, uh, came there. He invited Washington and a couple of of others over, and he said, "We'll have oysters and crackers." So <laughs> I'm not sure Washington was that that was the the meal that Washington was familiar with, but oysters maybe I don't know. But anyway, uh, Payne Payne paid his his own way uh, then. He he was yeah. on his own, and um, uh, the during the revolution. Uh, some states confiscated property from the loyalists, and New York confiscated property from a loyalist who lived in New Rochelle, and they gave that property to Payne as a, a gesture, this, we're, this is your payoff for all that you've done for helping to win the war. And it was a large chunk of property. It was it was more than 300 acres, and uh, and had a nice house, but but when Payne was back in France, the, the house had been struck by lightning and burned, and so there was just a small cottage there that I think probably was built for a handyman to live in, a hired laborer to live in, and so Payne lived in in that, and he did stay there on his own for a while, but it was a, it was a really isolated. Uh, place and Payne was a, a social animal. He he liked to be with people. It was gregarious, uh, uh, right? Yeah, right. And so uh, he he found it just too isolated for for his taste. So then he went back to mooching. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a sad ending. I, well, and I think it's fair to say, and you make this point in the book. If we, if Thomas Payne had been able to collect royalties the way modern writers do, off of his writings for common sense, for the rights of man, for the age of reason. He would have been undoubtedly an extremely wealthy man in his own time with no need 
uh, you make it clear most of his life he's not really interested in money. He is not interested in, in collecting. He certainly wanted to collect royalties, but it was almost impossible for 18th he, century I mean, writers he, to do that. He gave away a lot of the money. I mean, yeah. much, much of the money that he earned from common sense he gave to the Continental Army. He, most people may, if they were familiar with Payne at all, they may not realize that Payne soldiered. Uh, he uh, immediately after the Declaration of Independence, he joined a voluntary group from Philadelphia, and they marched to the front. This was just before the Battle of New York began, and it was just a short-term thing. When it was over, most of them went home, but Payne went up and got on the staff of General Nathaniel Green and was with Green's staff during the retreat across New Jersey in November of uh, 1775. And so uh, he gets shot at during that. He's, he's in a combat situation uh, during that, that time period. So um, uh, I forget what your question was well, just, now. Just that, that, that he didn't collect the kind of oh, that, that's that a right. modern yeah. writer yeah, would yeah, right. and, so successful. And, and I, I think because of his, that, that military service, he, he saw the deprivation of the soldiers and he gave away uh, much that he, he earned. It, it's sort of an interesting thing. There's some, some new uh, studies that have come out within just the last couple of years that I think have made a pretty persuasive case that Payne's common sense probably did not sell as many copies um, initially as as historians uh, thought. And what what they've done is just they, they looked at how many copies printing presses could produce uh, at that time, and then they ran the numbers on it, and they just they came to the conclusion it was just absolutely impossible for for as many issues to have been printed as as it was commonly thought. But even so, Payne's common sense probably sold fifty or a hundred times more copies than. Than the, the than uh, John Dickinson's letters from a Pennsylvania farmer, which was the 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 biggest selling pamphlet in the rundown to to the war and to to independence. So Payne made a lot of money. He said one time, he I forget the exact figure that he used, and he put it in terms of English pounds, and he said I could have made this much money per day off of the book. And I ran the numbers on it, trying to convert it over to something uh, meaningful today. And what Payne was claiming was that he he could have made about $50,000 a day off of common sense. And sometimes Payne exaggerated, <laughs> and he may have been exaggerating then, but he did make a lot of money and he gave a lot of it away. And he was just never, never wealthy. And, and uh, to, uh, toward the end of the revolution, he's reaching out to Washington and to Jefferson and to others to help uh, in persuading Virginia, for example, to give him some money as, as kind of a pension or a reward for, for what he had done. Pennsylvania and New York came through Virginia didn't. And then late in his life, the last two or three years, he's still doing that. He's reaching out to Congress mm -hmm. Then, uh, and he and Congress turns a deaf ear uh, toward him. So he he winds up selling uh, some of that property in New Rochelle uh, that that he had gotten. The, the rest of it he wound. And remember, I mentioned he stayed with uh, Nicholas Bonneville Mar and his wife Marguerite Bonneville for five years. Mooched off <laughs> to, for five years, and he winds up giving them. Uh, that property in mm -hmm. in New Rochelle mm -hmm. uh, as a payback. Very recently, um, in talking about Thomas Paine, I told someone that of all the founders who would be most at home in the world we live in right now in the 21st century in 2018, I, I felt like it would be Thomas Paine, that he would come here and he was somewhat of a social leveler, I think he advocated for a, what we would today call a social safety net for elderly people, for those who could not take care of themselves, who were poor and indigent, uh, long, long, 150 years before the New Deal. And, I, and maybe, maybe he wouldn't be quite at home. But I think even in terms of racial equality, 
gender equality that we see today, I have the sense that he, among all the people you mentioned earlier as being the mainline founders, would be most at home in the world that he would find today. Do you do you agree oh, or disagree? Oh, I'd, I'd certainly agree with that. I, uh, I I wonder about someone like James Monroe. Even when when he's president, uh, he's still wearing the the garb of the 18th century with the knee breeches and the silk stockings and whatever. And everybody, all the other men had gone over to trousers by that time. I wonder if Monroe would still be wearing that <laughs> if he came back today. But no, Payne, Payne wrote a pamphlet in uh, 1797 that's, that gets very little attention, although somebody did write an op-ed piece in the New York Times about a year, a year and a half ago, and they mentioned it. I was delighted to see that they did. It's, it's a piece called Agrarian Justice. And uh, I think what, what happened by then, Payne is getting somewhat disillusioned uh, by 1797, that even in France, uh, there are, are changes, and they're cutting back on voting rights. Not as many people can vote and uh, as, as had been the case in the early 1790s when there was basically universal manhood suffrage uh, there. And uh, I, I think Payne begins to kind of rethink things, and, and, he, and he, he thinks, well, where, where he had thought almost all of the, the problems had arisen because of monarchy and because of aristocracy, he takes a broader view in agrarian justice. And he's concerned about poverty. And he feels that once somebody falls in, into poverty, it's almost impossible for them to extricate themselves from that. And not only that, but they pass their condition of poverty on to their descendants. And their descendants even live a more deprived life than, uh, than they had. And so that somehow or other something must be done that would offer, that would be a ladder for people to climb out of, of poverty and have some opportunity for a good life. And so what Payne comes up with is a solution in 1797, uh, about 130 some years before Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal in the United States with a proposal that looks very much like the New Deal proposals. He's, he's proposing make work projects that look like uh, Civilian Conservation Corps and, and the other make work projects of the New Deal. But he also has a, a pension plan, and, and unlike Social Security, which is a pension plan for the elderly, Payne tagged on to his pension plan the idea that there would be a, a pension or a subsidy given to each person when he was 21 years old, so that when the person was starting out uh, but also starting out in the sense of probably getting married and having children at about that point that the, this subsidy would help them get started. And then in addition, there would be a pension late in life. And he put it at age 50 rather than 62 because uh, uh, people live shorter lives mm -hmm. by and large. Uh, back then, so he's 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 looking at sort of both ends of the spectrum when you're starting and when you're you're winding down uh, you, uh, your life. So he he would I think he, he was the most modern of of people and and the most modern too I think in this in the sense that Paine had a secular. View. He wrote The Age of Reason in the 1790s, and it's a visceral attack on the Bible and on Christianity, though he was, he was a believer in a deity. He says in the first line or two of The Age of Reason, I believe in a God and only one God, he says. So he, he was a believer. Do you think he really did? I do, or yeah. Do you think I, he I, felt he had to say that? No, no, I, I think he really really did believe in an afterlife, and he tried to live a good life. And he, he interestingly enough, he and Jefferson come to, to the same conclusion, and that is that 
the that there is an afterlife, and uh, that w what what determines whether you have lived a good life on earth is how you relate to other people and try to help other people and do good for for the common cause and and that sort of of thing. So I, I think Paine really really did believe in that. I, I think his he he. He, he was a product of the Enlightenment, which was questioning... Revealed religion. Right, yeah. And uh, also, I think he he had an axe to grind against the church and the clergy because it had had been used by monarchies and aristocracies to, to maintain order and uh, keep, keep the general public in, in the European countries quiet and and hopefully happy and not not being revolutionaries and whatever and so he wanted to to try to 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 drag people away from that and uh make them realize that that uh, make them believe that what the church had had been telling them was was a fable a superstition and and jefferson at one point says that Jefferson's a believer in democracy and Paine is a believer in democracy. The conservatives of their age weren't. The, the very last letter that Alexander Hamilton writes is that democracy is the great poison in America. But Jefferson and Paine believed in, in democracy. And Jefferson said that he thought democracy could work if people were well educated and if they were not led by superstitious beliefs peddled by the church. Yeah, I was going to say, by which he meant, of course, evangelical right. churches. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Jefferson makes sense. Thomas Paine makes sense as an apostle of revolution. Um, I have to ask, in the time that we have left, why James Monroe? He seems an odd choice. He is always, I think, for people who study American history, he seems something of a lightweight, if you will, both in terms of his mental capacity, not not physically, of course, because, as you said, he soldiered. I believe he was at Valley Forge. He was, um, yeah. He, he yeah. as you mentioned, wounded at Trenton. Um, certainly, he's an American patriot of the first order, uh, but even among presidents, he's, he's that in that movement between what we think of as the founders and the age of Jackson. So... I'll ask you in a couple of minutes why James Monroe. Why did you? Why did you? Why is he the third part of this trio? Okay. Yeah, I, I, well, I chose Monroe um, uh, for, for several several reasons. But one is that he certainly believes the same things that that Jefferson and and Paine believes. He's not not on their level. There's, there's no no question about that. Uh, he's just kind of a stalwart. Uh, believer in in and committed to to what they they were committed to work very diligently very hard to to make that uh, uh, a reality. He knew Jefferson. Uh, he studied under Jefferson. Was close to Jefferson. Uh, uh, he knew Payne. Payne lived with him for about a year and a half after he liberates him from. Uh, from prison, one of those people Payne mooched off, <laughs> in fact. And so uh, he is involved in both the American Revolution and the, and the French Revolution. At, at Valley Forge, I think that's his transformative experience in a sense, that he becomes very close to a French volunteer who is about his same age, a young a uh, fellow who had dropped out of school, like Monroe had dropped out of the College of William and Mary to soldier. This this fellow named Pierre Duponceau had dropped out of school, came over here to soldier on behalf of the American Revolution. He was probably better educated, had more formal education than Monroe did, and he introduces Monroe to the Enlightenment, and um, I, I think that becomes a transformative experience for for Monroe, so he's caught up in in the American Revolution, and and very badly wants to see as much as Paine does. He wants to see the French Revolution succeed and spread across Europe, and he wants to see the the America America's ties with France 
uh, preserve, and he knows that they're under attack by by a great, the, by the most conservative Americans. So he's working in the 1790s for the French Revolution and for the the Franco-American alliance. So that that all of those things were why I included Monroe in the in the book. In just a few moments that we have left, I want to. Um just play a, a quick uh, word game with you, if we, if we can. You might call it Rate a Founder. You, among authors that I've talked to, you've probably spent more time in the 18th century uh, in, in, in the lives and times and in the papers of the people we consider mainline founders. Um, I'm going to throw out a name. You tell me whether that person is overrated or underrated, and in maybe two sentences, tell me why you think they are. And we'll start with Thomas Jefferson. Uh, well, I don't think Jefferson is overrated. I, I think Jefferson deserves the credit that he's gotten. If you look at Jefferson as a polit- as a man of ideas and as in his public uh, role, he's not not overrated. I mean, the Declaration of Independence is a majestic document. It's it's as Pauline Meyer titled her book on it. It's American Scripture. Alexander Hamilton. Uh, Hamilton uh, deserves credit uh, for his economic uh, views. He, he shapes really the modern American uh, economy. It may take to the late 19th century for it to, to flower. Uh, certainly he's an extremely bright guy, dedicated person as a soldier in the American Revolution. Uh, I have some problems with his, with his political views. I think he wanted to build bulwarks against change in uh, America, and and you can see his handiwork in the Constitution. Benjamin Franklin. Uh, I have the greatest admiration for for Franklin. I mean, just not just as a politician, but I mean, he did so much in Philadelphia before the American Revolution. Great writer, uh, inventor. Uh, could be a duplicitous individual at times, but I have the greatest admiration for Franklin. James Madison. Uh, Madison I have a, some trouble with uh, in, in the sense... Is he overrated? Uh, well, um, it, yes, I think he is probably uh, o- overrated. Uh, I, I think he... Th- th- there were... I think the Constitution was needed. There were problems in America, but it could have gone in different directions. It went in the direction that that Madison was pushing for, and some of those directions were mistakes, I think. Interesting. <clears throat> Patrick Henry. Um, Patrick Henry, um, he's... I mean, he turns against Jefferson later on, but I, I give him his due. I mean, he was, he was a, a major figure during... Uh, the coming of the revolution, better wartime governor than Jefferson uh, was, and so I don't think he's overrated at all. John Adams. Uh, Adams, I think, um, is, I I certainly wouldn't say that Adams was was overrated, though I think he was not a very good president, Uh, but he, he was an extremely good congressman, very bright guy, I think the thing that impressed me the most about Adams is that <clears throat> in Congress he becomes the person that the other congressmen see as the person who is the best informed person on constitutions, on diplomacy, even on the war. He becomes a one-man war department in the in Congress. So certainly as a congressman he's not overrated. And finally, George Washington. Well Washington I think is not overrated as president. I, I think the country really uh was fortunate to have Washington as its first president. It he held things together for those first eight years. Most people probably don't realize how fragile the American Union uh was. And and even Washington, I think, made many mistakes as commander in chief during the the revolution. wasn't a very good strategic planner in in many respects, I think. But even then, when you consider 
who else might have been chosen to command the Continental Army? Washington was probably the best choice and for, for that uh, position. So uh, maybe a little bit overrated as, uh, as commander-in-chief, but not as president. One of the things I have to say I've always admired about your writing is that you have never been afraid to be critical of George Washington, right. especially uh, as a commander, as I, a military I, man. I, I got an email from somebody a couple of weeks ago that he said, I checked out your book on George Washington. I turned it back into the library after <laughs> 200 pages. I couldn't read another word. And I guess he, he, he preferred the Parson Weems version, version of Washington. Which you certainly won't get in, in your books. <laughs> well, John Furling, uh, your new book is called Apostles of Revolution, Jefferson, Payne, Monroe, and the Struggle Against the Old Order in America and Europe. It's just out from Bloomsbury. Thank you for being on the podcast, and good luck with the book tour. All right. Thank you, Stan. That concludes our interview with author John Furling about his latest book, Apostles of Revolution, Jefferson, Payne, Monroe, and the Struggle Against the Old Order in America and Europe, published earlier this year by Bloomsbury. The interview was recorded at the Planners Inn in Savannah on September 13, 2018. My thanks to John Furling and to his publisher, Bloomsbury. The hardest working engineer in show business, now the czar of our Tallahassee office, as well as the captain of the GHS Under 40 soccer team, is Brendan Cannonball Crellin. Our mailman, this week and every week, is Crimson Tide fan extraordinaire, one Gary F. Taylor, born and raised, that's right, who is away this week attending the Westside Nut Club Fall Festival in Evansville, Indiana, but he promises to be back next week. Our legal counsel this week and every week is provided by the law offices of Gallipo and Taylor, where their motto is, let our inexperience be your guide. Catering this week provided by Hagee's House Tacos, home of Big Al's Deep Fried, Tie Dyed, Jekyll and Hyde, Father of the Bride, Continental Divide, When Worlds Collide, Bonnie and Clyde, Take It in Stride, Don't Eat This and Then Hang Glide, Drippy Enchilada. If you have an iPhone, you can find our podcast at the App Store or on the podcast app on your phone. If you have an Android, look for us at Google Play. Tell your friends and family about this because (laughs) anything this bad has to be heard to be believed. You can find out everything about the Georgia Historical Society at georgiahistory.com and the Georgia History Festival at georgiahistoryfestival.org. Please also check out my blog and similarly painful podcast at deatonpath.georgiahistory.com. If you have any comments about this show or anything about life in general, drop me a line at sdeaton at georgiahistory.com. As always, thank you for listening. We hope you'll come back next week. So long, everybody.